And I should ask you all if you're uh, comfortable sitting down and getting comfy in your seat, because what I want to do is to talk to you about how sitting is probably killing us and our children. So I've got you here as a captive audience for an hour and a half. I'm not sure if this is the best venue. <laughs> I, I think you've probably heard lots of media reports of sitting is the new smoking. And alongside those, this isn't new information. We've really been bombarded with some of the, the recommendations, the messages um, that have come about from information we have about sitting. And these are just clipped from Get Great Britain Moving to remind you that if you sit for eight hours or more a day, you have double the risk of having a heart attack. Even if you go to the gym, you're not protected if you still sit for eight hours a day. And, and last week, uh, Dr. Ahmad, she talked to you a lot about solutions. So how do we find those messages? How do we come up with those recommendations? And, and what I want to do with you tonight is to talk to you a little bit about the science that goes toward finding those solutions, creating those recommendations, and importantly, at times, changing the recommendations and recreating the solutions. So it's a little messier than the solutions because we're constantly in a flux of new knowledge but hopefully I can convince you um, over the course of this evening uh, that we've got a problem, and it's a problem that we all need to work toward solving. So tonight I'm going to cover a few things. I, um, I want to talk to you about the harms of sitting. What do we know? How did we get there? Um, I'd like to talk to you about the, the biological control or the, the evidence, if you like, for why do children move and particularly biological control, because I think it's a part that we've largely missed out in terms of the way in which we've created solutions. This isn't a finite set of information. I just want to try and <coughs> convince you that there's some plausible evidence out there that perhaps we should be considering. And we have to consider that because it has implications for the way we intervene and the recommendations we make. So can we actually break up sitting time in children? And does it matter how we do that? So let me start by saying that this is something that we've known for a long time, that people who move more during the day aren't obese. People who move less during the day tend to be obese. So obesity, in part, is a disease that's related to a lack of movement. And this comes from London, those iconic double-decker buses that back in the 50s, a super study was, was run, where they compared the drivers to the conductors. So the drivers who sat behind the steering wheel in all that horrible London traffic for eight hours a day were compared to the conductors, the people who walked up and down the bus, ran up and down the stairs, collecting the fares, as they did in the 50s. And it was a really simple study, but really very elegant. What they showed was that the conductors had uniform sizes, two sizes smaller than the drivers. The first evidence the first sitting study, if you like, to show that obesity was in part a disease that was related to sitting a lot. Even more elegant in that study is that there was a longitudinal follow-up. And they followed those drivers and those conductors for, for a few decades, actually. And they looked at the incidence of coronary events. And not just how many coronary events occurred, but the severity of those events. And they found that the drivers those people who had those eight hours of sitting every day, they had twice the chance of having a coronary event. When they had a coronary event, the outcome was a lot worse. It tended to be fatal. So back in the 50s, we knew that sitting was bad for us, but we kind of ignored it as an as a, as a issue in, in society. A little bit like smoking. It took sort of 20 years for us to really grapple with, with change. In about the late 90s, um, it kind of re-raised its head. And this was a series of studies that the, the Mayo Clinic conducted um, out of Jim Levine's lab. And, and these were very highly controlled experiments where they took groups of lean and obese adults. They all lived within the Mayo Clinic for a fairly lengthy period of time. So they lived in the same environment. They weren't allowed to exercise. They didn't exercise during the, the entirety of the study. And they measured very carefully how they, how they lived, how they expended energy. 
And, uh, and the initial thought was that the, the lean probably had a higher basal metabolic rate. But actually, that wasn't the case. The, the one item that really identified the lean from the obese was the amount of time spent ambulating and standing across the day. And that was about two hours more than the obese. And in the converse, the obese sat for those two hours. So it led to this, this group. They did some underfeeding and overfeeding studies. They, they termed this as people who were, they had a predisposition to move more. And there were individuals who had a predisposition to sit more. And that was one of the reasons why we stayed lean or we became obese. And I use the word predisposition because there's a biological control to that, because these people weren't exercising. So it's just like me now. I'm standing more than you. Um, that's only because I've been, I'm up at the front, and you've been forced to sit down in the chair. But some of you are toe tapping. Some of you are scratching. Some of you are kind of moving your legs, wriggling around, sneakily looking at your phone under the table. All of those things, amazingly, expend energy. And that's where part of that standing and ambulatory energy expenditure came from. It wasn't literally pacing up and down the lab like one of those little rats that's got its wheel removed and they're having to find another way of expending some energy. It was all the other things that you do all the time that expend energy other than sitting. And that same kind of study was conducted in children. And this is actually conducted in Hong Kong, my, uh, my, my old home. Um, by a girl who became my postdoc, and this was her PhD. And she also was interested in how the obese child and the lean child spent their day and how that differentiated the two groups. And so she measured, again, really quite carefully, the entire day's energy expenditure. And she found, again, that the one thing that differentiated the lean from the obese was sitting time. And the obese children sat, similar to adults, about two hours a day more than the lean children. So both in the lean adult and the lean child, the thing that they seem to have that's protective is this daily energy expenditure, which is time not spent seated. And the obese child, the risk seems to be that they're spending considerable amounts of their day seated in comparison to the lean. So again, obesity in part at least, you could call a sitting disease. We, we don't have as much evidence about other diseases in children as we do in adults. So in adults, we know that if we were to sit you uh, for eight hours, we know that your ability to regulate glucose declines. Uh, we know that adults who are um, habitual sitters have a decline in their vascular function, the function of their arteries. And we know from that old London bus study that that um, in probably is the, one of the reasons why you have an increased risk of heart disease. We, we started to do some work with children looking at vascular function, arterial health, and sitting to see whether um, the arteries of the child are protected in some way. So even if they sit, we don't see a, a dysregulation of arterial function. So we've done a number of studies in our lab at, at UBCO. And this particular study involved a group of uh, young girls. So they come to the lab. We have a mock sitting room. Um, it has all the toys that you would have in a normal house. It has iPads, it has Netflix, it has sofas, it has, it's a comfortable place to hang out for the kids. And we ask them to sit for three hours. And so we, we do an experimental model of prolonged sitting. And in this particular study, before and after the seated period, we measure arterial health, and in this case, in the leg. And how do we do that? I'm just going to show you a little clip. This is the uh, ultrasound that we use. At the bottom is the velocity of the blood flowing through the vessel, which is in the little green bar. We cuff the leg, so the velocity is decreased. We release the cuff, and you see this huge surge in, in blood that you can see here. That surge in blood flow creates a stimulus that causes a vasodilation or an increase in the vessel size. And that is the marker of vessel health. So a healthy artery is one that can dilate. Essentially, the vessel, which you're looking at here, it increases substantially. And that increase is really a major marker of arterial health. And as we get older, the ability of that vessel to, to dilate declines. And when we sit in adults, it declines. And when we sit in children, this is the vessel, the marker of vessel dilation. It declines from our baseline to our 
post-sitting, it declines substantially, about 33% in children. So we established that actually sitting is just as harmful for children as it is for adults, and it's just as harmful in terms of obesity, it's harmful for vascular health. So I think we're, we're pretty sure that we know that sitting is bad for children too. But how do we get to sit so much? So I have a little quiz for you in a moment, and you're going to ask yourself, how did we do that? But first, let me just talk about the child's day and how did we get the child to sit so much? What does the child's day look like, the average child in Canada? We could split this day up into a pie graph, and we could see that the majority of the day is spent sedentary. And there's a, a fairly large amount of light intensity activity and a small amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Well, we know that moderate to vigorous physical activity, we usually get it through exercise. We know that's a profound biological stimulus, but the volume is really low. So only 9% of Canadian school-aged children attain the one hour a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So very few children actually attain this. So it's a really small portion of the average child's day. In contrast, our sedentary time is also, we now know, a profound biological stimulus a negative stimulus, and it has huge volume. Uh, and this is a graphic, again, from um, the recommendations, the, the, the report card from Canada. And you can see that up here, these are our age groups from grade 6 to grade 10. And this is the percentage who actually achieve the no more than two hours of screen time a day. So the average child in grade 6, about 20% of them have less than two hours of screen time. But by grade 8 and grade 9, that drops right down to 7% and that persists. So how much screen time do these children have? I'll just draw you up to this bar here. If you can see up there, 500 minutes, that's eight hours. That's eight hours of screen-based entertainment per day on average for the upper years. So that's grade nine and above, essentially the, 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 the high school age group. It's a huge amount of screen time. And that screen time is largely seated. There's not too much screen time that's done ambulatory. So how on earth did we get to the point where we sit for eight hours a day? Okay, I'm not going to read the quiz to you, but I want you to give yourself one point for each of these 10 items that you answer yes to. I'm not going to quiz you on your answers. I, I, I won't go around asking how many of you said yes to item six, don't worry. But how did you do? Well, I think most of us at least chair imprisoned, possibly chairaholics. And I don't know about you, but my day looked a little bit like the chairaholic or chair imprisoned. I got up, I walked to the car, I drove to work, had lots of meetings, spent seated, I ate lunch at my desk, spent seated, I left, I got back in my car, I drove here. If I was you, I've then captured you and made you sit for another hour and a half in that already sedentary day. Then we might go home, check the emails, sit back on the computer, seated, and then kick back with a glass of wine and watch an hour of my favorite Netflix. My day is not eight hours of sitting. My day is probably 15 hours of sitting when I include my work seated time. So although we think eight hours of sitting in a youngster, it's extraordinary. All of us sit for huge amounts during the day. There's very few of us who don't sit for huge amounts. But how on earth did we get enticed to sit for so long? How did we get consumed, if you like, by the chair? So I just want to take you back to what I think is really a very long courtship. And these courtships are... Uh, this is a 200-year-old courtship with, with sitting, and it really happened during the Industrial Revolution. So we moved people out of an agricultural base, a largely standing environment, walking environment. And we moved people into factories en masse. And as the machines automated, we had lovely production lines. So people sat while they, while they worked in the factories. And we moved children out of factories, and that was obviously a good thing, um, certainly not... Uh, suggesting we 
put kids back on the child labour and that's my solution, but you know, <laughs> occasionally you might be tempted. Um, and we moved them into schools and early schooling, we moved them into a factory model. We made long lines of desks and we sat few in chairs because you were very obedient when you sat like that and it looks prettier now, but it's amazing that a hundred years later, we still use that as our model. And we urbanized, so the car became ubiquitous in our lives. And a child's day looks a little bit like our day. They get driven to school in a car or a bus. They sit all day at school. They might get out at lunchtime and have a run around. They get driven home. And whereas perhaps before they would run around outside, go kick a ball around in the yard, their friends come over and they go downstairs and they play Xbox for an hour or two because that's what kids nowadays do. And so it's very easy to see how sitting has become so pervasive in our lives. And we as humans who were once ambulatory, leg bound, have become chair bound. And what does that mean in terms of intervention, solution, biology? I, I just want to throw out a couple of um, issues that have occurred or changes that occurred that, that are re relatively controversial, but I think are really worth considering, particularly when I'm a proponent of the physical activity side of the equation. This graph is a graph of, uh, from CDC in, Canada, in, in the USA. So this is the Center for Disease Control in the USA. And they looked at, from 1999 to 2010, um, they looked at the total energy intake in, in kilocalories. And this is something that we've known for a very long time, that actually the total energy intake has differed little over the last 40 years. In fact, compared to the post-war era, it's actually gone down in both adults and in children. The way we eat is different, what we eat is different, but the calories consumed for the average child are about the same. So this is our boys, the green total. And you can see over that 10-year period, it's actually gone down. The girls have had a few lips in there. It's pretty much stayed stable for 10 years. And yet, this is data from the USA, where obesity rates in this population have been rising over this 10-year period. So what's changed? So if energy intake has pretty much remained the same, slight oscillations, and we've grown, we've gained weight over time, the thing that's changed is the way we expend energy. And we know that energy expenditure has gone down over that same period of time. So the calories in now are excess because they're more than we're expending. So no surprise we have an obesity crisis. We don't have great data actually looking at change of activity over time, but I did find this data from a Japanese study for that same 10 year period, which I think is really interesting. So this is data collected using pedometers, so it's steps per day. And over a 10-year period in Japan, boys declined from a 20,000-step day to a 12,000-step day, and girls from 16,000 to 10,000. So energy expenditure, the amount of time we ambulate, has declined massively. So steps per day in both boys and girls has gone down hugely over 10 years. And in, even in countries like Japan, they have a, an increasing obese child population. So, so no surprise there. So when we think about what do we do, how do we intervene, we, we often look at um, environmental changes, psychological changes. And this has really been the mainstay of physical activity interventions. So if we increase physical activity, we assume that we decrease sedentary time or sitting time. And to change physical activity, we focus largely on how can we go about making environmental changes. Maybe we bring in a change to the playground. We, we change something that's after school. Perhaps we appeal to psychological traits within the child. We try to convince them through messaging that being active is good for them. That doesn't often work because children are seldom convinced by their health benefits. It doesn't have resonance the way it does with us as adults. Or perhaps we convince them because of some hedonistic pleasure that they might get from being active. And that tends to work with adults. We, we tend to find pleasure in, in taking up exercise certain exercises, but again, hasn't been so successful in children. So I want to talk to, to you a little bit about the potential of biology causing a little bit of a spanner in the works, if you like. 
because systems that are under biological control are actually quite hard to adjust. We, there's lots of ex, uh, examples of when we can adjust them. Um, we can adjust them. Um, we could adjust our temperature, for instance. So you get a, a, a disease and your temperature goes up. So your body resets its temperature uh, gain, if you like, and now you operate at this higher temperature and we need some kind of intervention to re reduce that temperature. So something extraneous can change a really very, very well controlled biological system. But they, they don't change easily to those extraneous um, environmental challenges. And so I want to show you some evidence that we started to think about, is there a biology behind physical activity which actually makes it really very difficult and very challenging to achieve change when we create solutions? And that biological control for physical activity is part of this larger control system that's energy balance within the body. And we tend to rather arbitrarily think of energy balance in a very static way. It's energy in and energy out. It's that lovely analogy of the weighing scales. A little bit like I've been talking to you, too much in or too little out, and you've got a problem. But I think what we know with biological systems is there's a lot of uh, oscillations, if you like. And those oscillations occur over time. So take energy intake, that it goes up, and then there's a compensatory response to the energy output over time that then brings that intake down, and then it oscillates back up, compensatory responses, so that we have this green bar of balance somewhere in the middle. And these changes are, there's, there's always a, a kind of compensatory mechanism. We don't really understand how that works with physical activity, but it, it, it's plausible, it makes sense. So if energy expenditure is a plausible part of all of this, what does that mean in terms of, of activity in children? Well, we can burn energy in multiple ways. You can burn energy right now just sitting still listening to the lecture, rather passive. Those of you who are not toe-tapping, scratching, itching, it's met basal metabolic rate. It's the calories you burn doing not a lot. We can burn energy eating, the thermic effect of food. We can burn energy moving, activity thermogenesis. And that comes from the work that we know so far in two, in two packets, if you like, the volitional part, the exercise, and that spontaneous part, the toe tapping, the itching, the scratching, the getting up, just wandering around when you take a phone call, the things that you don't think about that burn energy. And if we think about the huge range of total energy expenditure across any age, and so this is, you know, you could call it a, a sneeze plot, there's a huge spread massive variation in total daily energy expenditure in the youngster up until we're about middle-aged, that if we take a child, 12-year-old, two 12-year-olds, they're the same size, they're the same sex, the basal metabolic rate doesn't really differ at all. The thermic effect of food, the burn from eating, is only about 10%. So this one child here, who isn't burning a great deal of calories a day, and this child up here, who's off the chart, the piece that accounts for that is that activity thermogenesis, the burn from moving. So we, so we know that. And it makes sense that all of these other parts of this energy balance equation are under strict biological control, that a part of that activity thermogenesis is too. We know that thermic effect of food, basal metabolic rate, calorie intake goes down with age. So does physical activity in animals and in, in human children. And this is really from the moment you become ambulatory, you start to decrease your, your total energy expenditure. Largely, you don't move as much, and it's a slow process. So this is a nice clip, actually, from a recent Stats Canada um, ad. But this comes from evidence that's longitudinal, and this is a study that was conducted in the UK that showed very elegantly that from you know, early childhood to late childhood, there is this progressive decline in boys in terms of total activity, light as well as moderate to vigorous activity, and a progressive increase in more sedentary, so their total energy expenditure goes down, and the same in girls. So all of these things go down with age. Some of these things we know already, huge evidence that there's strict biological control. And if I was to ask a group of undergrads, um, which of these is 
not volitionally, but spontaneously, if you like, controlled by the brain, there's only one on this list. The undergrads usually pick at least three. I think they hope that, that the, the dollar sign and a few of the other things somehow happen automatically. Uh, but we know that there's some evidence that that spontaneous movement, that neat movement, the non-exercise movement, is an automated response of the brain, part of our energy control and energy balance system. So I won't go into any details here, but suffice to say that these very tightly regulated, centrally controlled systems require fairly big challenges to change them. And there are elements of activity that we've tried to tease out to see how easy are those to change. So there's two ways of thinking about this. Elements that are not very variable and are not very changeable when we change the environment generally tend to be under stricter biological control. And so that was the sort of the hunch that we went into when we were looking for what could we change if we want to try and reduce sitting time and increase activity. So I want to take you a little bit uh, into some data that we collected uh, with this hunch in mind. And this was data that goes quite far back where we used heart rate monitoring. So the children wore a belt and a watch for three weeks at a time, and we had minute-by-minute -minute heart rate readings. And in that original work, we were looking for actually evidence that the current, that then guideline of physical activity for children was working. And the then guideline for physical activity for children was three times a week, at 20 minutes sustained, at least moderate intensity exercise. So this was in the 1990s, and that was the then guideline, physical activity guideline. And what would that look like? This is a heart rate trace over 12 hours. And if a child was to, to have one of those 20 minutes sustained pieces in the day, it probably wasn't this piece, this is probably um, running around in the playground in the morning, uh, but it's not long enough, and there's not enough of it over this middle bar here, which was our cutoff for this child for moderate. But at the end of the school day, they spent a lot of time. They, they had their 20 minutes. They ticked the box for that 20 minutes of continuous exercise. So what did we find? And this helped us understand a little bit about what was easier to manipulate, where to manipulate, was that Hardly any of the children attained that physical activity guideline. So go back to our 9% now. This is the old guideline. This is a fairly large sample of 100 boys and over 150 girls. And just under 4% of the boys and less than 1% of the girls attained the guideline. That was three continuous 20-minute periods of moderate exercise a week. So we looked to say, well, OK, they don't do moderate. Let's say they do 10-minute pieces. They don't do the sustained 20 minutes. It's too long. And we had about 23 of the boys, 12% of the girls, have three sustained 10-minute periods of moderate intensity activity. And bear in mind, moderate intensity in a child is a brisk walk, not a run. So pretty, pretty sedentary. And this is, this is all data now. Interestingly, they changed the guidelines to not be three sustained periods, but you could accumulate 10-minute blocks. But we knew back then that very few children accumulated 10-minute blocks. So we said, OK, what about five-minute periods? That seems, that seems doable, right? You can move at least for five minutes a day, three times a week. And we had a, a much bigger response with the five, 70% of the boys and 50% of the girls. But what could we change? So if this is sort of biologically entrained in the child, they're not, you know, they're not doing this sustained activity, but they're doing short bouts of activity, we wouldn't see a change when we move the child from the school environment, which is what these data are, the weekdays, into the home environment, Saturday. But what we saw is a huge decline. So whereas 70% of the boys managed these sustained five-minute periods at school, only 30% did at the weekend, and only 12% of the girls, so a huge decline in the girls too. So that told us that if we were going to create a recommendation, it was a recommendation for the home. And we felt that this moderate vi to, to vigorous physical activity was definitely changeable. Um, it was variable. It varied in response to just putting the child in a different environment. So. Our biological control, question mark. 
we moved forward because the, the recommendations changed. And we started to understand that even five minutes is a long time for a child when it comes to activity. And most children have really short bouts of movement. And you know that if you have your own children. They're up and down, start, stop, all the time, particularly when they're in the, the younger years. And that is very surge of energy, then sit down. Surge of energy, then stand still. They don't tend to do the continuous activity that, that we do as adults. And so we used a slightly different approach. We tagged the kids with these accelerometers. And instead of looking for bouts of activity or total activity of sedentary or moderate or these sort of clusters of activity, we looked at how activity varied in terms of it patterning across the day. So everything is collected second by second. This is a, day, a, a snapshot of a trace. And we took, thought about breaks in sedentary time. So the red bars are the sedentary periods where the data falls below. And we could look at the length of those periods. And these oscillations above, donated by our blue bars, are breaks in the sedentary time. And we could see how long those breaks were, how intense those breaks are, and how many occurred across the day, as well as how long these sedentary breaks are. And we use that to compare obese and lean children to understand which part of this patterning differentiated the lean and the obese. And could we then move to a recommendation that was much more about specific elements of, of the, 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 if you like, the pattern of physical activity. And these are the data. So what we found was there were two things that differentiated the lean from the obese. And that was the total breaks in sedentary time. So this isn't total amount of moderate to vigorous activity. This is just total number of breaks across a day in sedentary time. In this case, we call them clusters. And how long, then, the sedentary periods were. So if you break up your sedentary time more, you don't have as much, you don't have as much sitting time. If you have more active breaks, you have less sedentary time. What was interesting was, the length of those breaks didn't differ between the lean and the obese. And how intense those breaks were didn't differ between the lean and the obese. So it didn't seem to matter how those breaks came as long as you broke up your sitting time. And these are weekday data. And when we go to the weekend and compare it to the weekday, a very similar finding to our original older heart rate data occurs is that the, weak, the, the, the home environment, in a way, is the most toxic when it comes to sitting. So we have the child at school, and we actually do get them up quite a lot. But when we bring them into the home, they sit a lot more. So far fewer breaks in the sitting, in the sitting time. And because of that, greater sedentary, longer sedentary periods. Interestingly, the duration of the breaks was marginally longer at the weekend. So they had fewer, but they were slightly longer, but they had a lot fewer. But the intensity didn't differ from the weekday to the weekend. So school, home, it doesn't, it doesn't make you any less or more active in terms of intensity, but you certainly take more breaks in sitting time. You sit more at home. So with that in mind, we could think about the variation. And this is just one more slide, a different way of looking at data like these. And so we said, OK, how variable are these particular aspects of the movement pattern? Because if we're going to focus on breaks in sitting time, we need to know that we can alter those. So this is simply the, the variation within the individual of each of those components. And in animal systems, activity, daily activity, if you take a a little group of rats and you monitor them over months in a cage, there's quite small variance in their activity, their wheel running habits, and that's free living. They vary around 20 to 25% over the course of months. So really very, very contained, repeatable amounts of activity a day. And what we saw was that in terms of the duration and the intensity of the breaks, these were very low variation, between 12 and 20% variation. They were the same. This is uh, three weeks of monitoring these children. So very little variation in how intensely they moved, how long each of the breaks were, but much bigger variation in terms of how many breaks they had, and then, of course, the opposite, the, amount of, the length of sedentary time. So we kind of felt that if there was going to be something that was 
much more, if you like, susceptible to environmental change, it's likely to be the breaks in sedentary time. That's what was differing at the weekends. That's what had a, a reasonable amount of variation. So we felt that it was very susceptible to some of those challenges, if you like, we could throw in the way of, of the seated environment. And that brings up this really very messy, I'm not going to try and explain all of this to you, it's a forest plot of uh, what's called a meta-analysis where we gather all the studies that have been conducted that have tried to raise physical activity in the usual way in which we've been doing it. That's to try and increase the amount of time spent moderately, vigorously, physically active. And just think about this middle line here, this long vertical line, that's on zero, that means ineffective. And ineffective, it falls to the uh, left of that bar, if it's a minus figure. And each of these bars are these individual studies that have tried to do this. And there's only a few in the forest plot that stick up above that lovely forest canopy. And the majority of studies are around our zero mark. And if we take the summary effect of all of these studies, if there was an effectiveness of those interventions, we'd expect this number to be 0.5, and it's 0.16. So, you know, the question we have is, are we focusing on the wrong thing? That moderate to vigorous activity, the amount of time that we spend being moderate to vigorous, we know, number one, children don't do. It's not very variable, so can we really impact it? And that's what's made us really try to think that this may be something that that, that biological control, this isn't volitionally, this is volitional activity if you make the child do it, but the spontaneous activity simply isn't moderate to vigorous activity. And it doesn't come naturally during the course of a day. So it, it made us think about intervention. It's made us think about the recommendations and the solution we have and to shift our focus. So to shift our focus away from that traditional recommendation of moderate to vigorous to the idea that just get up, break up your sitting time more, because it's going to make a difference. So I want to just show you some evidence of breaking up sitting time to finish with, and some things that we've played with, and these are no rights or wrongs, and we're still really in a period of time where a lot more data is needed, but just some ideas of what, what, what we've tried, can we break up sitting time? So if we break it up, is it helpful? We don't have a huge amount of information around that. Uh, does intensity and duration really matter? Uh, we tried to probe a little bit about that. So we we aren't, we're not discounting moderate to vigorous physical activity. And I should say that you know, exercise is a hugely important part of daily energy balance. But for the average kid who's sitting for eight hours, who's not exercising, maybe duration and intensity doesn't matter. And can we get children to wait to be seated? Can we change this sitting environment? So I'm going to go back to that original study. And the first question is, are breaks in sitting time effective? So remember, this is our girls. They came, they sat for three hours. We showed dysregulation in arterial function. They came back on another occasion, and they sat for three hours. But after 50 minutes, we put them on the bike, and we made them cycle for 10 minutes at a moderate intensity. And we did that at the end of each of the three hours. We did the same measures, and unlike our sitting without moving, where we saw this big decline in the ability of the blood vessel to dilate, we protected the blood vessel by getting kids up and moving them once an hour. So this was great, but this is a laboratory intervention, and you know people don't have little mini exercise bikes right there for sitting on for 10 minutes when you're watching TV, sadly. So we tried to think about, well, that's not really real world. How can that translate? So we started to look at high-intensity interval exercise, which is what we have here in our dark bars. And that's the you know, one minute, 30 seconds of running real fast, multiple times, resting and then running real fast. And it really helps because it's very similar to general habitual activity in the child. So it really mirrors very nicely. And we compared that to moderate, that sustained sit-on-the-bike kind of activity. And this is back, again, to the arterial health in the, in the leg. And what we showed was that uh, this is just a marker of that arterial health, uh, a marker of, the, the, if you like, the, the stimulus, that 
if we exercised children either with these short, sharp bouts, we got a big increase, which is beneficial. And that increase was similar in the moderate, but it was actually better in the short, sharp, one-minute exercise bouts. And it persisted after an hour. So, you know, one of those bouts, and these were uh, a, a series of short, sharp exercise bouts or a 12-minute a, a cycle. You can do that, and you've got protection for an hour. And then you probably have to get up again. And that was however we looked at it. There's uh, the, the patterning of how the blood flows. When it flows forward, it's great. And again, that high-intensity exercise in the dark bar is protective. It persists, just like the moderate. And this is our backward blood flow. It's a little bit you, like you uh, kayaking down the, the, the river with the rapids. It's like the blood vessel, when it's got blocked, it creates a rapid. It causes those eddies that aren't so great for kayaking in. There's a reverse flow and sometimes no flow. And that reverse flow is a bad thing for the artery. And we found that it declined after exercise, which is a good thing. And it persisted again after an hour. So I... Um, I felt that, you know, in a way, it doesn't matter what exercise, it works with both moderate and high intensity, short, sharp, or continued, continuous bouts. So whatever, whatever you fancy doing in this context is good for arterial health in terms of a break in sitting time. When I came uh, to Kelowna, um, I worked with a, a pediatrician who said to me, Ali, nobody comes to my center and says, I'm really worried because my child isn't, isn't exercising enough. He said, no, no, nobody comes to the doctor and asks that. Shame, shame that they don't. They come to the doctor and they ask, my child isn't doing well at school. The math grade, I'm worried about them. They don't socialize. He said, if you can show that exercise is beneficial to brain function, that might resonate better with, with parents. So we took this model of arterial health into the brain, and we've run similar studies monitoring blood flow to the brain. And we see a very similar thing we show that that blood flow to the brain is increased. And this is uh, a number of different um, intervals here. These are sprints in the uh, red bar. And then the open bar is a rest interval, a sprint, a rest interval, six times. And then this is a sustained piece of moderate intensity exercise. And what we find with blood flow, which is a little bit different, is that it's maximized in the first minute of exercise from a sprint context. So the child sprints, and they get this nice rise, 10% rise in brain blood flow. That rise stays in the rest interval. Then it's slightly smaller, and then goes back to baseline, declines slightly below because you start breathing really hard by the sixth sprint. We get something similar in the moderate. We get a great response in the first few minutes of exercise, and then it kind of just declines back to baseline. So if you like, if you want the biggest bang for your buck, exercise and brain blood flow, one, one single one-minute sprint is going to raise brain, brain blood flow in the child by, by about uh, 10%. And this is equivalent to, say, doing a, you know, a series of jumping jacks or jumping on the spot. So it's quite translatable. Now, what that means long-term in terms of health outcomes, we're not sure. We're just trying to see whether we can refine an exercise that we could take into a solution. So one of the last things that uh, I want to share with you is something that we've really thought hard about. How do we compete against screen time? And I think that's a really hard thing. You know, we all love our technology. We love our phones. We love our tablets. It's, it's really, you know, enticing. And you're a child and the whole world is at your fingertips. So when mum says, you know, you're going to go for a walk with me, you know, I had to put my phone down. I had to put my tablet down. It's not exactly appealing. So we spent a bit of time thinking, could we fight like with like? What if we could make that screen time active? And what does that look like? So we ran a couple of studies using different types of modalities. And in one of the studies, we, um, we compared just what the energy expended was when you sat in screen, played a game on, on the screen, or whether you played a similar game in an active, uh, in an active manner. And we used a, a game called the Xavi X, Jackie Chan Challenge. Uh, I conducted this uh, uh, work in Hong Kong, and you become a Jackie Chan, you are the avatar, and you have to walk through the streets of Hong Kong on this mat, uh, jump over hurdles, and the most exciting thing for most youngsters is when the ninjas come down, you have to stamp on the mat to get rid of the ninjas, and then you can carry on, score points. And it's actually fun. It's actually extraordinary how hard some of the kids play. 
uh, where they get heart rates up at 180, really charging along to, the more you do, the more challenges that come in front of you. So it's got some resonance. And, and, and what we found was that that active gaming environment, um, particularly the active game, the Jackie Chan challenge, really burnt a substantial number of calories and was, you know, you could make that otherwise seated calorie, fairly negligible screen time, something that was now important. And that data got moved into an intervention which showed that that arterial health that we'd been working on could be improved if you did that regularly. We did another study where we thought, well, you know, we want to be able to get kids in regularly to an intervention. And we worked with an obesity clinic. So we had a, a group of teenagers who were all obese in the clinic. Their average weight was 80 kilos. And we wanted to do a walking intervention with them. So those of you who have teenagers and were sort of suggest a walking intervention with your teenagers would get little resonance, let alone if you have an obese group. You're not going to get teenagers to come four times a week to walk. So we converted some treadmills where we had a walking gaming treadmill where they could walk and play Xbox games at the same time. And we had a huge uh, um, uptake of the, of, the, of the intervention. They seldom missed a session, and they all reported the bit they liked most was the gaming. So we'd kind of have to kick them off the treadmill after an hour because they'd be so into the game they didn't know an hour had passed. So it was actually great in that sense. And I'm just going to show you two rather, I have to apologize for the quality of the video clips um, because these are definitely not uh, professionally produced. These were just two video clips we took in our lab just to show you the games to give you an idea of what those look like. So this is Jackie Chan. And we've got our child here stamping on the mat and Jackie's running through the streets. Bashed into a hurdle there. And he's got to jump over some hurdles, sidestep some hurdles. And the best part is when the ninjas come down. And they can make Jackie go as fast or slow as they like. And now they have to stamp the ninjas out before they can keep going. And then they keep running. So it's, it's, it's kind of fun when you're that age. The, the difficulty is that the game tires. So you've got an issue with continuation. This is our Xboxing in a sedentary uh, environment. Just. Uh, I think my daughter would kill me. This is when she was very young and we, she knew she was up here on the screen. She, uh, she might not be so impressed. And this is her walking. She was a complete Xbox addict. And the piece that we really wanted to know is could they actually Xbox and walk? And, you know, the answer is yes. These, these kids are genius. They can Xbox and walk really easily. And the same occurred with our, with our obese group. So a cautionary tale here. So we thought we'd hit the jackpot when we had stuck the Xbox on these videos, because we thought, well, this is great. The children are walking. Their hands are busy. They have a controller in their hands. So unlike the seated environment, they're not going to snack. So we ran a study to show this. And we, uh, we weighed a series of snacks. We had a, um, an open, if you like, cupboard of snacks with the child in the seated gaming environment and the child on the, on the treadmill. So we thought this was great. This was going to be the publication that we were going to get to show that you know, just having your hands on that controller, because you're walking, you're not going to get to snack. And sadly, we did not find that was the case. These kids are genius. They can walk, Xbox, and eat. I don't know how they do it, but somehow they managed to control the game still with one hand while they snack. The extraordinary part of this, and really quite distressing, was that some of the kids were taking in 700 to 900 calories in an hour in snacks. So these were like those little fishies and the kind of usual stuff that the kids would just hand-to-mouth snack. So the cautionary tale is we hadn't hit the jackpot. Um, yes, you can make screen time active, and it's got some resonance there. Um, but you don't necessarily solve all of the, the issues that you're hoping you've solved. So just to summarize, uh, sitting is ubiquitous. You know that. You've sat here for an hour already. It's something that we've entrained into our lives. We know that it worsens with age. Uh, we know that uninterrupted sitting is harmful in children. So our very young preschooler sits less than our six-year-old, sits less than our 12-year-old. And by the time they get to grade nine, we've got a real problem. We know that breaking up sitting is, is undoubtedly beneficial. We just need to know how to do that. 
and I think some knowledge of what is changeable and what's not, that there is very plausibly biological control for the kind of spontaneous habitual movement that we all do during the day, some of those aspects aren't as changeable as others. And that may, may help guide what the next set of recommendations for children are. And I'd like to finish with this quote because this is something we have to remind ourselves of often when we're doing this work. When we think of how can we stop children sitting, how can we make them wait to be seated, really want to wait to be seated, and we kind, of, we kind of despair in a way because, you know, a lot of our favorite schemas, our recommendations, things that we've worked towards creating don't work. They're failures in the world. But the important part of that is that those failures guide the new schema. And they guide, they're going to guide the next research that's going to help us really understand how to create that solution to make children wait to be seated. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>